Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. On today's episode, I am joined by John Eberhart. And John and I got to meet up at the Total Archery Challenge up in Michigan to talk all about the differences in big woods and farm country whitetails. Little do most people know that John hunted the big woods for 20 years before we really got into farm country. So we talked about that, pre-season scouting, prepping your hunting locations, finding the security cover, and just some general hunting stories within. So I think you'll really enjoy this with one of the the legends, especially in the saddle hunting community and DIY hunting community. I think uh, I was really excited to, to get to do this one. And like I said, today's episode is brought to you by Onyx. And the Onyx Hunt app is your premier GPS hunting app that turns your phone into a working GPS. This time of year, I'm scouring the maps on the desktop version of the app to look for areas to scout, as well as potential hunting locations for my annual Western hunt. The new 3D feature makes it convenient to look for hidden benches and understand the lay of the land. If you want to check out the Onyx Hunt app for yourself, head over to onyxmaps.com and use the coupon code EMW to save 20%. Tether is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting. I'm using the Phantom Saddle System with the Predator platform for all of my mobile hunts. To learn more about tethered and saddle hunting, head over to tetherednation.com. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are back with a lifetime no-fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. Maven just released their new RS5 4 to 24 by 50 millimeter single focal plane rifle scope that's built for those that require the precision of the long range dialing with the fine reticle benefits of the second focal plane. You can use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT to get a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. And that includes binos, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, range finder, etc. And last but not least, Spartan Forge. As hunters require an accurate forecast of the best hunting days and the best hunting spots to save time on scouting and executing the hunts, the Spartan Forge Outfitter utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic and state research. They're using science rather than someone's opinion to figure out movement for your specific hunting area. You can use the code EASTMEETSWEST to save 25% off of the outfitter at SpartanForge.ai. All right, on today's Mountain Buck Story of the Week, otherwise known as Mountain Buck Monday over on social media, this story comes from Brenton Wanger. So Brenton had wrote in to me and said, this fall I had killed my best buck to date in Pennsylvania. I had three days at the hunt at the end of October, and the first day was a washout. Not wanting to waste the day, I put on some miles scouting and still hunting through some new areas. By mid-afternoon, I had worked my way into a thick creek bottom between two clear cuts, filled with deer sign. Shortly after I started running into a bunch of sign, I saw a buck cruising past me at about 30 yards. It was still raining steadily, and he had no clue that I was there. By the time I got an arrow knocked, he had worked down across the creek. With the buck still in sight, I decided to literally run after him and try to cut him off. On the other side of the creek, I came to full draw with a pine tree between me and the deer, and when he stepped out from behind it, I shot him at 10 yards. This hunt definitely taught me that to be successful in the big woods, you have to be willing to put in the work and be persistent. And sometimes you need to think outside the box and get creative in order to have a successful hunt. That's a pretty awesome story, Brenton. And uh, some cool photos if you get to check them out over on the 
the East Meets West social media page on Facebook and Instagram. Got some photos there of, of Brenton with this deer. And then also as he packed it out with his buddies, looks like later that night, really cool story and awesome buck. So keep sending in your mountain buck stories, love sharing them. And yeah, I really appreciate it. So as far as any other news going on, just uh, Mountain Buck Scouting video series is up last week. I had a new episode. We have one more of the series for this year coming out next week. So be paying attention for that. So t- it's over on my YouTube, which is just under my name, Bo Martonic. And uh, other than that, I think uh, just getting through some summer scouting here in the next couple of weeks getting out checking some cameras putting some more out that i probably won't get back to until the fall and really looking looking forward to that but main focus right now is on the mule deer hunt so been doing some e-scouting and gear preparation practicing my stuff got to seam seal my tent and do some different things there uh just working through it and looking forward to being prepared to the end of august when i head out west so hope everyone else had a great 4th of July weekend here, Independence Day, and was able to to celebrate with friends and family and, and this great country that we live in. So hope you had a great weekend and are back to it with this episode with John Eberhardt. All right, we're live. John Everhart, welcome to the show. How you doing, Bo? It's good. It's good. <laughs> good to meet you here. I was uh, I was excited to to get to meet you. I was telling you about beforehand. I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, and um, and I was told that you were going to be up here. And I was like, I just wanted to meet you in person and get to talk to you. And and the one the one challenging part about this was I was like, you've been on a lot of podcasts before, and I was like, I want to talk to John about different stuff that he doesn't talk about and other, you know, and other. <laughs> Venues, uh, venues, yep. yeah. Standard, generalized venues. Yeah, I get it. Well, yeah, it's good to good to see you here. How how's the show going for you so far? Uh, well, not too bad. You know, this has been here for quite a few years. We're at uh, what do you call it? archery? Uh, Total archery challenge. Total archery challenge up yeah. in Boyne, and uh, I've known about it, but I didn't know it was as big as it is. Yeah. So this is my first time ever coming up here, and it's. Pretty awesome. Yeah. I'm, pretty, I'm actually pretty shocked. Being a sales rep in the hunting industry, I should have known this was as big as it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. It's um, the Total Archery Challenge, when I told the Tethered guys and they were thinking about going to the Seven Springs one, I was like, this is your crowd. Like, yeah. this is 100% Meat and potatoes, blue collar hunters. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And, like, dedicated hunters that just love, love hunting, love bow hunting. And it's this is... It's a it's a really cool event. Get to meet a lot of like minded people. Well, heck, I was trying to get you to sit down and have the show here, and had a whole bunch of people coming up and talking. You seem like the local celebrity here today. <laughs> well, it is Michigan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is your home state, right? It's my home turf. Been writing articles for in Michigan for thirty years. So yeah. So uh, are, have you lived in Michigan your whole life then? Yes. Okay. Yep. And how how far away from here are you? Uh but two and a half hours. Two and a half hours south. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty much dead center of the state. Gotcha. And is that is that specific area where you've always lived at? Nope. I'm from the Detroit area. I uh, <laughs> kind of interesting. In 197, I got married in '72, and in 1973, I just hated it down there. I hated the traffic. I worked in crap hole factories. Yep. Plastics factories, steel factories. Made mortars for the Vietnam War. Um, and I just couldn't stand it down there. I literally married with two children, quit my job, and moved up north. And lived on welfare for the first six months. Just just struggled. Five-pound bricks of cheese, free milk, and all that yeah. stuff. And uh, and I got a job in a little shithole place and just worked my way up, kind of. So. Yeah. And, you, and so is... Are you still in a factory today, or you said you're a sales rep? Uh, no, I'm a sales rep in the hunting industry. So okay. when I moved up north, I found took the first job I could get, which was a terrible job in a factory. Then I went to work as a uh, at Jay's Sporting Goods, which is the largest Michigan independent sporting goods store, yep. as the archery buyer in 1975 through 79. And uh, then I finished drywall board for 14 years. I loved that job. And uh, then in 1992, I took a job as a sales rep in the hunting industry. 
Okay. So I'm the sales rep in Michigan for Coleman and Allen Company and um, a bunch of hunting related and outdoor related products. Gotcha. And I've had that. I've done that since '92. Nice. Yes. And I'm sure that's more up your. I your love out. my job. <laughs> you love your I'm job. I'm 70 and I don't want to retire because <laughs> I like my job. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's great. That's kind of where I'm. I'm hoping to be somewhere in that. You know, range. so I, I work yeah. in a I work in a factory now. That's. Uh, um, it's in the steel industry, but for mm-hmm. making electrodes for electric arc furnaces. Okay. Yeah. So, and graphite uh, industry, big heavy industrial type place. So I, I can understand a little bit of, of that. <laughs> I hated being a factory rat. And you know what? I just decided I'm going to chase my dreams. Or back when I moved up north, there was just a lot more deer in northern Michigan. Yeah. So that was one reason I wanted to move up north, but I just hated living in the city, near the city. Yeah. And I was like, I'm just going to quit move up north see what happens and it's worked out i live on a lake in a beautiful home and it's just worked out yeah that's i i'm excited to see this area of michigan and even most of michigan during the daylight hours because last night i drove up and it was all dark once i hit (laughs) michigan so i didn't get to really see much of it but i what i've heard is just like northern michigan and michigan general is just it's beautiful it's beautiful well i'd say northern michigan is beautiful yeah when you get to central michigan and south it's just your typical ag slash timber mix yeah so and it's flat yeah, that that makes sense. It it um I was surprised to see a ski resort here. You know, I'm driving yeah. up, I'm like, I don't remember going up any hills, you know. <laughs> you were right on the edge of the hill country. Okay. From here up to the bridge, it's relatively hilly. Yeah. Have you have you done much hunting in the northern Michigan area? I, for twenty years I exclusively hunted timber, big timber. Okay. And um that's when I first moved up here. And then I gravitated away from it. I moved about 20 miles south of where I first moved when I was up here. Yep. And that's where it started getting into ag and timber mix. And tag and ember, ag and timber mix is much, much easier to hunt because you have defined destination locations. Yeah. Big timber is very difficult to hunt because deer tend to wander. You don't have the feeding destination locations like you do in ag areas. So I've gravitated to more ag timber than I used to in all big timber. Yeah. But you still had success in the, the big timber areas too, didn't you? Not not as consistently successful yeah. as when I switched over to ag. But yeah, I yeah, I was I tried like when I first moved up here and I worked at Jay's, I always tried to kill the biggest buck of anybody in the store and most of the people in the area. That was always kind of my drive. And I was usually pretty consistently successful at yeah. that. Gotcha. What what would be some? I mean, I know you're talking about the destination food sources, but before we got on air, you were talking about scrapes and mm-hmm. stuff too. The differences. Kind of give me some of the differences that you've seen between the two of those. Yeah. Anytime you have a lot of ag, you know, the more ag versus timber. Like, let's say when I go out to Kansas, you know, where I'm hunting in Kansas is 80 percent ag and 20 percent timber. Yep. And there's very, you know, once the ag is cut all the deer are confined to that 20% of timber. So it's a lot more consolidated. And you see scrape areas everywhere, you know, and when you hunt these draws and stuff where deer have to transition through because it's the only security cover available once the ag's down. Uh, So you see scrape areas a lot in ag areas. Um, But once you get into big timber areas, because all scrape, primary scrape areas revolve around doe activity. So when you get into areas where it's all timber and deer tend to wander and browse, you know, there, there's oaks everywhere, there's beech nuts everywhere, you know, there's whatever the mast is around, there's a lot of it all over. So deer don't have very defined destination areas. So when you don't have that defined destination doe activity, then you're not going to have primary scrape areas because primary scrape areas are always places where there's a lot of heavy doe activity. Yep. And and that makes sense, like, as far as, like, in Pennsylvania, where I hunt, um, there's two different types of, I guess, areas that I would call. You have the areas where there's a lot of logging activity and a lot of diversities where I see more of those primary scrape areas because, like, you get the logging cuts, it seems to concentrate yep. where the does are hanging out and, and bedding and stuff. Then when I go to the areas that are all mature for, forests where they're not... It's not the sign isn't as readily available, I guess, is that you would see in some of those areas where you get some more of that concentration. Even if there's not a ton of deer numbers, it's still you still see that um, that activity. And I think the the buck to doe ratio is pretty good where I'm at too. Yeah, because the the does, you know, they feed on those slashings in the first 
year to four years of growth. Yeah. And so the deer congregate in those old timber, you know, clear cuts. Yeah. What, so what did you what did you focus on, like, when you were hunting the, the big timber type areas? Like, what were kind of some of your main hunting? I areas? tried to focus on white oaks. Okay. Because there was always oaks. There was always oak ridges everywhere. There was scattered oaks all over the place in big timber. Um, so I tried to concentrate on white oaks because they got less tannins. It's more of a preferred food. If there's red and whites, they're always going to go to the whites. So white oaks were probably number one. And then also, if it was a big timber area where the timber was all mature, where there was no understory, security cover underneath it because the canopy of the timber didn't allow the sun come through. So there was, it was just bare ground underneath with maybe some ferns. Then I would gravitate and uh, all my rut phase time, I'd go down into the swamps where the deer were bedding once the foliage was down. And then those were typically all day sits or yeah. in my tree way before daylight and not till dark. Yeah. The, the, the swamps, I mean, like that's, that's, a, that's one of the things that like at least, in Pennsylvania where I'm at, it depends on if, if you get in the areas that are more flatter, you start seeing more of those swamps and it definitely seems to hold those. I mean, like it's thick in there. You like you said, it's not, no, it's, it allows the sun to come through. You get a lot more undergrowth vegetation and everything. And usually it's a little lower ground and it's more moisture. So you have more vegetation and more brush and taller weeds and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Did you, was there, what, what were the, some of the things you focused on around those swamps for those all day sets? Well, what I did is I, I, I've always, probably since the mid-70s, I've done all my scouting during postseason, you know, once the season's over. So I'd go into those swamps, and I would actually scout in February, March, and April as soon as the snow's gone. Yep. So I'm looking at the runways from last fall because typically by that time of the year, the deer aren't bedded in the swamp because there hasn't been any hunting pressure. They're bedded outside of the swamp. So all the sign that's in the swamp basically was there from last deer season yep so i'm looking for where there's congregations of runways running together or a lot of times you'll get down in a swamp you or you cross a river or you cross a lake and you get back into some area that not many people go and i also look for the same thing you know a lot of times you get in a swamp and there's pieces of high ground i just posted a video on our youtube channel a couple months ago where we found a little island in a huge swamp and it was probably 30 acres across, just a little 30-acre mound, and it had uh, six oaks on it. I mean, and that's just that's just a hot spot. Yeah. The, the, my state record buck that I shot in 1981, that was, you know, there was a high piece of high ground back in the middle of a cattail marsh. I had to wear chest waders through waist-high water almost a quarter mile to get back to that island. And unlike nowadays where you could see that on an aerial, back then I could just, I, I would... I just saw a couple treetops back in the middle of this cattail marsh. Yeah. So I put on waders and went and see what the hell it was. And it was an island. And, man, deer were bedded all around the perimeter of that. There was two trees on it and had scrapes underneath the branches because I don't think a hunter had ever been on that ever. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think, like, with, um, like, say, being able to see the aerial maps and stuff, that's made it more difficult because people are identifying it? It's made it more difficult for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because it's easy to identify that. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, now, I mean, you can kind of go through and cross areas out or find areas to check out so much easier than having to just walk Ab it. Absolutely. You can see you can see all that high ground because marsh grasses and swampy areas are very identifiable. And then if you see a little mound of, you know, canopy trees, you know, there's an island of high ground there or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes that and that and everybody's looking at that now. Yeah, there's yeah, there's so much information out there now on that specific topic. It's absolutely like that. Yeah, yeah that, that totally makes sense. But one thing you can't do with an aerial because a lot of times when you're looking at aerials, they're basically you're looking at them when they got the canopy of summer on. Yeah. So a lot of times when you're looking at timber areas, until you step foot on the ground, you have no idea what it's going to look under those trees. So, you know, whether there's going to be enough understory and security cover for a mature buck to move through during daylight hours. Because to me, that's that's a mistake a lot of people make. They, If they're looking for deer sign and buck sign in particular, or mature buck sign, yeah, um, you know, they'll see mature buck sign and they'll set up on it without that particular location having the adequate security cover for daytime movement to it or away from it during yep. daylight hours. 
it just doesn't have the security cover requirements, which yeah. in Michigan and PA you have to have that. Yeah, you do a hundred percent because you can't see you can't see that on the the map, and that's for like when I'm doing like aerial scouting for mm-hmm. big wood stuff, or really anywhere. It's just like I'm trying to get a general idea, and then you know putting yeah. boots on the ground. I I love you know what you were saying there with like the postseason scouting. That was something like my. My dad has drilled into me since, you know, I was a kid and then we've all been, that's my, I spend, I put over 200 miles on every spring, just hiking areas and learn. And that's when I do most of my scouting is yep. as you can, as you can see, I'm not married and don't have kids so I can, <laughs> at, at this point. So I have a lot of time to, to be able to do that because things do look a lot different than they do on a map. Like it, oh. just from that you know underneath the canopy sort of deal yes to me scouting preseason which is you know what that's what all the tv guys do and that's what most people do yeah that to me that's just a waste of my time yeah because if you're prepping a location during preseason you know it's going to be hot outside you're going to sweat scent control is a big deal you're going to change the visual Uh, whereas during postseason you can stink the joint up you can spook every deer out there seven days in a row from daylight till dark in March, and it doesn't make any difference. Deer are going to come back, and you, and also the foliage is down. So when you're going to, you know, six, 55 to 65 percent of mature bucks in the record book are taken during the three weeks of the peak pre-rut and rut. Yeah. So if you got a three to four month season, and three to four weeks of that season is when six, 55 to 65 percent of the mature bucks are taken, that's the time you want to key on. And in most states, Midwestern states, during the rut phases, the foliage is down. So obviously, when you're postseason scouting, the foliage is down as well. You're at, you know, it's the end of the winter. Yeah. And you're looking at the area exactly the way it's going to look when you go back in there to hunt during the rut phases. So you can tell if there's adequate security cover. Whereas if you go in and preseason scout, there's foliage on everything and everything looks dense. Yeah, you prep something for rut phase hunting during preseason. You go back there first day of November, and it's like, wow, this totally looks different. Yeah, and the tree, you know, a lot. You may have prepped a prepped a tree in September because you had a lot of background cover because there's foliage in the tree, and you're only up there 18 feet, and you get out there, you know, in November, and now there's no foliage, and you stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, all that stuff matters if you're in a PA or a Michigan or a Virginia. Yeah. Details matter big time. Yeah, and and what you said there is such a good point. Like when you're scouting, scouting for the specific time of the the year. That's like, you know, for most people, you don't ha- you can't hunt the entire season. You got to focus on you know your highest priority. So that's why I've always focused on pre rut and and rut and the same yeah. thing. Like yeah, in the springtime, you don't have the foliage on. That's not you know the way it's going to be. It's just I've never I've never seen the benefit of the the prepping. You know, if if I'm Late on something, it's better than nothing, you know, sort of deal. <laughs> yeah. But or if you pick up something or you find a new spot in the summer, then you have no option. You have to do it. Yeah, summer. that's something I, that I've learned from you. Is like so, like I've I always did all this scouting, but I wasn't doing the prep, you know, or mm-hmm. practice. So now, like when I scout, I carry. I carry my climbing sticks in my saddle with me. So if I find a good spot, I can get up in a tree and see what it looks like and not just be like, oh, yeah, I'll come back here. And, and then you come back into the dark and on November right. 2nd. And, and it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be. Or you get in the tree and everything's in your way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't have any shots. Yeah, then, then that doesn't help you. And you could be in the best spot in the world, but if you can't shoot, what's that going to do? It's worthless. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, because you're, and I know that you're big on prepping yeah, trees ahead of time. So. so, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, and I prep it during postseason. Typically, when I'm postseason scouting, I'm not toting my prepping tools. Yeah. Um, but once I find a location, then I will physically go back with my tools and prep it. Okay. If it's on obviously private land, you know, I'm making shooting lanes, prepping the tree, so all I got to do is walk up to it and climb it. Yep. Uh, but on public land, <laughs> I'd be lying to say I don't somewhat clear shooting lanes on yeah. public land. That would be a lie for me to say that. <laughs> so I, I still do during postseason, even on public land, I'll Prep do some work. location preparation. Yeah. Obviously, I can't show it on a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and but when you're even just climbing into the tree, like helps you kind of identify some of those things. Like you were saying, you know, whether it's um, 
you know, how much back cover you have, oh, if there's yeah. even just, you know, one thing in your way or whatever that might be because yep. you get lazy with it, then you're get, that's exactly where that buck's going to go. When I'm, when I'm prepping a location, the first thing, and this is really important for guys prepping locations, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to walk the area because typically I'm hunting in a destination, somewhat destination area where there's going to be a culmination of runways coming together or a primary scrape area, maybe an apple tree back lost in the woods or a white oak or something. So I'm going to walk around the destination spot in maybe a 30-yard circle, and I'm going to be looking at the trees, and I'm going to pick the tree that I want to hunt when I'm doing that. And once I pick the tree I want to hunt, how high up in the tree I'm going to be, then I then I actually prep my shooting lanes first. I always prep my shooting lanes first. So I'll walk around the tree again. I know exactly where I'm going to be. And I'll walk around on the ru- farthest runways out and looking at the tree. And I find the spot where I've got to clear the least amount of stuff. Yep. And then I clean that. And that once I clean that shooting lane, anything inside of that 30-yard runway, if there's another runway at 15 yards, that's going to be clear as well. And then I prep the tree. So I prep my lanes first, then I prep the tree. Because when you do, if you prep your tree first, and then you prep your shooting lanes, I will almost guarantee you, when you get in your tree, there's going to be something you missed. Yep. So prep the lanes first, then prep the tree. Once you get up in the tree, you're going to see the stuff you might have missed. Mentally mark it when you get back down, finish cleaning that up. And then when you get back, it'll be totally clean. Because those little branches that you miss when it gets in low light and you can't see them, that may be what blows your opportunity. Yeah, no, most definitely. And like you, you said it earlier, those little things, those little, little details. Things. And I, and I know that's a, a big thing that you swear by and obviously from yeah. y- your success that it makes sense. So yeah, details, details matter. And I like to prep a lot of locations. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have probably 45 locations prepped this year yeah. going into season i mean not likely i already do yeah and they're not all locations that i prepared this spring you know they're old locations that i had to go back and re-clean up new growth from last summer and you know i'll probably only hunt 10 or 12 of them yep um but i've got a lot of options because i don't know what the crops are going to be i don't know if the oaks are going to be having acorns or apples are going to have apples or scrape areas are going to be active you know because sign changes from when you're scouting you don't know what the crops are going to be in yeah the mass so until you go back pre-season i always do a speed tour which is i usually do that after september 20th our season opens on october 1 when does yours open it's right around there it's the first saturday around october it could be like september 30th it could be all the way to october the 4th it oh. kind of varies in that okay situate that there so gotcha If you go back and you do a speed tour, now I'm a big scent lot guy. I pay zero attention to wind when I'm hunting. So I go back in full scent lock, and let's say I've got 45 locations prepped. Let's say 20 of them are early season locations. I'm going to go to those early season locations, as scent free as I can possibly be, and I'm going to see if there's apples in the tree or if there's oak acorns in the oaks or if the scrape areas are active because now they're next to a standing cornfield yeah and i'm going to pick my locations accordingly but i do it after september 20th for a very specific reason mature bucks are typically the bigger bucks are always rubbed out by september 5th so by me going after september 20th that's given them at least two weeks to lay some sign so if these oaks are dropping acorns, if these apple trees are dropping apples, if the scrape area is active, there's going to be, typically there's going to be rubs and other buck sign around them because yep. they've had at least two weeks to lay some sign. So now I'm going to look at the rubs. Okay, the rubs at this location are all, you know, they're two, two and a half feet up off the ground. So it's all small bucks. You know, when I start seeing rubs around, let's say this white oaks dropping acorns and there's some rubs in the area that are four, four and a half feet, five feet up off the ground, that's going to be a spot I'm going to put into my early season rotation. Yeah. So if if I go back and a lot of the trees have produced, um, I'm going to dictate which ones I physically hunt by the buck sign that's at them. And by going after the 20th September, there will be buck sign at those locations. 
Ah, that and and then from what you've done back in the spring with all your prep work, you have those options already there. Now you're just focusing on which spot. Which ones? Yeah, uh-huh. which ones that the food, right. whether it's uh, the, the trees are ready. The trees I'll are ready. Those. Yeah, and now you're just narrowing down the trees that are available. That are going to be the most opportune it. to take a good buck. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that makes sense. Of waiting until that you know after that September time frame there yeah. and being able to identify it because that's that is so difficult especially you get in areas where you know you have say a ton of oaks everywhere maybe maybe there's no acorns and then they i, I see it in mpa like some of the areas we have a lot of different elevation changes and say the tops have oaks and you start getting some cherries and and beach and stuff down towards the bottoms i've been where i post and scouted up towards the top had all the sign because last year had a ton of acorns then this next year had none right and they completely changed elevations and were you know bedding differently they were feeding Absolutely. in different areas and it was a it was a whole different early season's all about food yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It, exactly yeah and and honestly it's funny i i like i like and i don't like areas that i have that have no oaks because they're more consistent but they're also more difficult because they don't have that destination, you know, the draw of the food, the, the, the draw of the food. But when it comes to the, the rut and the pre rut, they're more consistent because there's not any, you know, they're browse deer for the most part. And they're, they're right. doing similar things year after year after year. You know, there's primary scrape locations that I'll find that have been, you know, worked for 15, 20 years that are just the same spot. spot. It's just yep. been, you know, it'll have out, like 10, 12 licking branches you can see that have been just busted under some hemlocks or years. whatever. And it's dished out three inches. Y- yeah. It's pulled out. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy to be able to, to see that. But back to the, the prepping thing, when I first got into saddle hunting mostly so mostly what i had done in the in the past and these big timber areas were climbers and then some you know tr- uh, like hang hang on tree stands and stuff but mostly mostly i would go in and just hang all my stands and then have a climber was my mobile setup you know sure so once i switched to like um hang on tree stands and then eventually to saddles it was like I took mobile hunting. Oh, just, I can climb any tree, and you can, but you still got to do prep work. You still have because I do was prep screwing work. myself Absolutely. from not, yep. you know, being able to do that ahead of time and understand what I was getting into. And it was it was a learning curve for me that it took me a little bit to to understand. If you're if you're doing the DIY, and my biggest buck I ever shot was on a DIY freelance hunt, and I've shot several of my better bucks just taken off cold turkey. I got a fanny pack full of steps and you know my saddle is in my pack and uh going in and and that is different because you're you don't have the opportunity to clear shooting lanes so when you're looking for a location you not only have to find a destination location that has the right amount of buck sign you have to also find a tree where you've got shots to specific areas and a lot of times when you're in heavy security cover you don't have that so you got to bypass it sometimes yeah and go to a place where when you do see something, you will actually have a shot opportunity. Yep. Uh, and, and another thing I, I see a lot of hunters do is they, they, they hunt buck sign without, without the adequate security cover. You know, if you're in the mindset of you're killing year and a half and two and a half year old bucks, and maybe every 10 years you kill a three and a half year old buck and you've been hunting 30 years, and you want to be more consistent at killing big bucks, you have to almost throw away what you know and start over because you've got to start hunting locations not only that have the adequate buck sign but it's got to have the adequate security cover for a mature buck to visit during daylight hours all the sign in the world is worthless if it's not getting visited in the daytime yep and you've got to have so if you let's say let's say you find a scrape area and it's along a crop field okay and you prep a tree because you don't know when you're postseason scouting what that crop field is going to be in. So you prep a tree there. Okay, let's say you go back and that field is in standing corn. That's ideal because then even if it's open timber on this timber side, you know, a deer, a lot of big bucks bed in the corn and they can just step out two, two yards off the corn and work the scrapes and then go back in the corn. Yeah. Uh, but if you find where you've got a primary scrape area, and that field is in hay or beans, soybeans or something short, and then you've got open timber, and let's say 300 yards away from the open timber, there's a bedding area. Well, if you don't have the adequate security cover 
for a mature buck to transition through or down the edge of from the bedding area to the scrape area, you know, so he feels secure, he's not going to visit that in the daytime. He's got to have the adequate security cover at the location around the kill zone and transition the security cover to a bedding area yeah. for him to visit that in the daytime. Yeah, no, that, that... In a pressured area. Yeah, in a pressured area and for mature bucks. Yes. Yep. That, that makes total sense. I mean, and that can be applied. It don't matter if you're hunting ag. It don't matter if you're hunting big timber. Doesn't matter it's, all, it's all the same Absolutely. concepts that... I've noticed that through deer hunting, no matter where you're at, the same concepts and rules kind of apply. Sure. It's just yeah. how you, how they're applied is, might be a little bit different. It, yeah. You know, it, it's like, yeah. like for me, like even looking at like a big oak ridge that's wide open and not anything underneath it. Like I don't even look at those areas much anymore as I would like just, you know, back a little bit that has, you know, whether it's mountain laurel or, you're a or, smart man. Uh, <laughs> or, or a, like a, a three to five year old cut that's coming up. Like, and I, I've learned yeah. just from spending so much time hunting these areas and for my dad that's bet it's funny my dad's an extremely successful hunter doesn't talk much about it i got him on the podcast before but he, he's very keeps tight lipped like i felt like i had to just be with him to learn what he did because he didn't even talk about it you know and and he always talked about you know some of these being able to shoot into that thick cover too even if you're hunting sure. the edge of it being able you just gotta to have a shooting lane into it you gotta Absolutely. have a shooting lane into it because like i'll even see during the rut you know i'll have these two-year-old bucks that are run that open in the edge and then i'll have the big one in the, the big middle. one that he's just inside it to yeah. a point where i'm like you know i didn't have these lanes or i didn't have a, you know any ability to to shoot into that and they just they, yeah they love that that's a little bit of security Security is important even when I go to Kansas and Iowa, and it's not uncommon out there to see a monster buck walk across a two-inch winter wheat field. Yeah. Okay? They're totally easier to kill than out, you know, in the Northeast. Yeah. Totally easier. And there's a lot more of them. But even out there, if you gravitate all your hunting around security cover, you're going to be much more successful. Because even though they will go in open areas, it's a much more rare rare thing that they would do. Yeah, just increasing your odds a little bit. A- absolutely. Yeah, I uh, the Kansas, I, we were talking again before we started recording, but I, I want to hunt some more of those states too. It just seems like it would They're be They're freebie states. <laughs> they just fall out of the sky out there. <laughs> I mean, I hate to put it in that general, but I haven't seen a mature buck in Michigan that I would shoot in three seasons, not even from a distance. And I'll see, when I go to Kansas, I'll see a dozen Pope and Young bucks in a week. Really? Yes. And when we were talking about the security cover, I can remember one hunt, and it was on public land in southern Michigan. And I was in a pine tree, and there was a little opening of weeds, probably probably a 30-yard opening to one side. And then there was a big swamp to the south of that that butted up to the pines. And it was in the middle of the day, and I could hear this doe running through the swamp. And when I say the swamp, this wasn't a marsh grass swamp. This was a brush, briars yep. swamp. You know, swamps consist of different things. And uh, I could hear, and then there was a lot of autumn olive in there too. And I could hear this chasing going on. And they would chase for 20 minutes and then they'd stop. And, and then they'd chase for 20 minutes and stop. And it kept getting closer. Finally, this doe busts out of this autumn olive brush and she w- runs right out into the center of that little opening, which is right, it's a, she's 15 yards from me, right to my left and I'm right-handed. So it's perfect. Perfect, I'm yeah. like. Oh, I'm going to kill this buck, whatever he is, (laughs) if it's a big one. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, and it was during a rut, so the foliage was kind of down. All of a sudden, I could see this antlers coming through the autumn olive, following this doe. And he's taking his time. And he gets right to the edge. And his nose, I swear, like if you drew a line on the edge of this autumn olive, his nose was right there. And he just stood there looking at that doe. And that doe would flick her tail, like, come hither. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'd flick her tail, and look, she's turned around looking at him. And at, she did that for probably, I want to say 20 minutes, but it was probably more like four. Yeah. <laughs> you know how time flies when yep. you're doing that stuff. And uh, finally, he turned around. He would not come out into that open spot. Yeah. 15 yards into that opening, he would not make that commitment. And she was in heat. He turned around and went back. And when he left, she turned around and went right back after him. One yeah. of the coolest things I've ever seen out, and it was like 150 inch buck. 
It was really? a monster for Michigan State. Yeah. Oh, isn't isn't that crazy? I I can think of an exact scenario where I was in a hemlock tree mm-hmm. and I was on the edge. There was some hemlocks and and some pines mixed in that went off the steep side hill, and then there was a, a newer clear cut in front of me, a little opening that was right there, and I had a a primary scrape there, and then there was some real. It was all thick in that, in that cut that was kind of coming up, yeah. and uh, I had the same thing. I could hear them running behind me in the in the hemlocks, and they came up. Doe comes out in the opening. I'm like, this is like a 12 yard shot, and he would not come out of that thick cover. She'd go back in, he'd run around, she'd come back out, and he would not and break like, that cover. And I could see him, but it was just there's briars up, and it was thick, and I was like. And I never got a shot on that deer, and it was just like, and they they end up running a different direction. It's just like, and that's that's what makes you respect mature. Bucks. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, how do you never let your guard down? Like, it's so rare. It is it is so rare that, that it's yeah, it it's incredible. I I love like, I mean, obviously that they have in living, you know, in Michigan, Pennsylvania, these places. All they're thinking about is surviving. Absolutely. I was like, man, if I was yep. a deer, I'd definitely get killed because I don't, I'm not that <laughs> consistent with, you know, with anything. So it'd be, that would be difficult. That's one thing I always preach when I'm talking about if you're hunting public land in a, you know, in the Northeast where yeah. there's just a huge general population and lots of hunting pressure is when you're going in on public land and you're postseason scouting, always look for security cover heavy security cover and always think to yourself everybody here is trying to kill me yeah so if you look at it from that perspective everybody's trying to kill me where the only places i'm going to go on this property where i might feel comfortable getting up and moving during daylight hours without getting shot and that's where you need to scout because that's exactly the same mindset those bucks have they live there they know where they can go to get away from humans yeah and you have to go to those areas if that's what you want to kill that, no, that that makes I, sense. Yeah, flukes happen once in a while, obviously, yeah. but if you want to do it consistently. Yeah, like it's it funny. There was this guy that uh, I'd I'd seen it was a few years ago hunting. I ran into him at the gate we were parking, and he he was there, pulled in right before me, and I was like, oh, I hate you know. He asked me where I was going, and I said, I'm just going to head back here. He's like, that's where I was going. I was like, okay. I was like, all right, you go there. I'll go somewhere else. He's like, no, 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 you you go, you go back there. I got stands all over. I had found all of his stands, and they were, like, in the wide open, like, all these things. I'm like, this sure. guy isn't going to kill anything. You know, thinking He's that. He's a deer deflector. And, it does, and, and <laughs> he thinking. killed, like, a 145-inch deer that night. And, like, one of these open. I'm like, I guess there's a fluke sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, and I was just like. I'm like, well, maybe I'm overthinking this, but uh, it, it, there is flukes, I guess, like you're saying. There's always going to be But it, it is so funny how always. the deer, like, depending on, like, the pressure and everything, there was this spot that I was hunting that had a lot of ATV trails that were illegally being used, but they people would ride up and down them and hunt off them with crossbows and all this other stuff. And, and what I found was... but. I, normally, I would just go to a different area, but there was a really, really big deer in there, and there was a hundred-yard stretch of the side hill that was thick hemlocks. That that's where the that buck was traveling through. My cameras are telling me it, and I ended up having an opportunity at him. I, I didn't end up getting a shot off, but that's where he would go out of all this spot. There was the just they know where the security is. They, they figure yeah. out the, the, the they human know pressure. Where I got to tell you a story, and it's not it wasn't my kill. I yeah. went to Ohio with a guy. <laughs> this is the strangest it's probably one of the stranger stories in my hunting career and we stopped at a rest area and it was down in the hill country so it was a public access you know like you're driving down the highway and there's a public a- you know rest yep. area deal except this was on a two lane it wasn't a, an a interstate and we go in there to the bathroom and I, I was in there a little bit longer than him and he walked out and right behind the building of the rest area it was a relatively steep hill down into a big river and the whole side of that hill was covered with mountain laurel and and just nasty freaking shit and when he walked up to the edge i mean and it had like an edge where it started to drop down yeah. you know what i'm talking about yep. we found it in southern ohio he he bumped a big buck there was a big buck bedding right behind that freaking rest area building because <laughs> nobody ever goes no there. nobody ever dicks with it the next morning, he I dropped him off there. He got in that tree. He went out there in the dark and got in a tree, and he shot that damn buck. No way. No, it's serious. Big nine point, like 140-inch nine point. 
That's awesome. It was so cool. Yeah. And he shot it out of a saddle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and so how many years have you been hunting out of a saddle? 40. 40 years. 1981 was the first season. And when I when I first bought one, nobody knew what they were. Yeah. I saw this poly bag in a store, and it was full of a bunch of seatbelt looking stuff. and But it had a little picture of this dude. Uh and it showed him kind of with little arrows moving around the tree and stuff. And I'm like, wow, that looks kind of interesting. You know, shooting 360 and you got the tree as a blocker to keep you hidden. You can move around the tree. And so I bought it. And it it was it was weird. It was awkward, you know, because I was used to hunting out of tree stands. And back then I hunted a lot out of two by six in a crotch, yeah. nailed into a crotch. Um, but I learned how to do it. Um, I stuck with it because... As awkward as it was, I could see the advantages it would have if I learned how to use this and modify it for me personally. So I made a lot of modifications to it, and I've never looked back. I think our tree stands are archaic. I think tree stands, once somebody learns how to hunt out of a saddle, they will never look at a tree stand again. Yeah. There's just so many advantages over a tree stand. I'm, I've got an article that's going to be in Deer, deer and Deer Hunting uh it probably is going to come out in July okay. on, on saddle hunting and the advantages. And I had 22 advantages over tree stands. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through some Yeah, no, no, that's that'd, that'd be great because i just give you a background. I started hunting out of saddle just, I guess it was three seasons ago, and I was very, like, skeptical about it, as most people are until sure. they do it. It's and, different. And I talked to Greg here and, and some other people, and they're like, just – try it out for your style of hunting where you're packing back in mile and a half two miles and some of this and your you know weight matters you're going up these hills and everything you need to try this i'm like okay Absolutely. and at first i'm like ah it's just you know and and carl always jokes about it too everyone's like oh you know it's just a tool you know in your tool in your tool belt and then <laughs> yeah. and as, as of last year i never got into a tree stand like you know it was just like the first year i was kind of like going back and forth just felt like like i should and then i just i don't i haven't found a situation where i needed a tree there's stand. no advantage a tree stand would have over a saddle so you got saddles made out of fabric so there's no noise saddles weigh two pounds so obviously it's not cumbersome you carry a tree stand you're buck and brush if you're on public land because you got to yeah. go through the brush to get to a decent spot yeah to my kill climber would stick up above my head four feet and i get hung up in the oh, laurel and everything knock else. you over yeah. probably once in a while and you know it's not like michael waddell walking down a pristine two track through open timber with a 22 pound climber on his back yeah. jumping in a tree and killing 150 incher for yeah. normal hunters that doesn't exist yeah exactly <laughs> so nobody's going to steal it you don't leave it in a tree you've only got one saddle to hunt as many trees as you want to prep um it's safer than anything else because you're tethered to the tree from the moment you leave the ground till you get back on the ground so you literally cannot fall it doubles as your climbing apparatus for as far as placing steps and sticks if you're hunting out of a tree stand hang on you basically have to have a separate climbing harness to put your steps and sticks in aside from your tree stand you have to have something different well the saddle is both because it's got a lineman belt, which you use for yep. climbing the tree with two hands free. Um, nobody's going to steal your stand. Nobody's going to hunt from it when you're not there. Uh, there's no signature in the tree. When you got a tree stand in a tree, they know where you're hunting. So, um, you know, they could hunt that area. Um, God. There's to the, so, to that, so to that many. point, um, I, this this area, me and this other guy that I'd run into were hunting the same buck. And we both knew it. And we're both like, you know, you're hunters. You don't always tell everything. You know, we're talking. Of course. And, and when I, if I find someone I know is a hard hunter in the area, you know, we I like to share information just to know a little bit about it. I don't want to screw him up and, you know, vice versa. He's like... I don't know where you hunt at. And I thought, because I don't leave anything behind. <laughs> I was like, I said, I hunt out of a saddle and I was showing him that, you know, and he's got stands all over that he's got to take down before, you know, sure. after the season, put it up before the season. Legally, he has yeah. to take them down. Legally, back yeah. yeah. Whether he does or not. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's like, it, it's funny. I'm like, yeah, you don't know. I don't know where I'm going to be <laughs> sitting at. It could be anywhere. You know, it's just, it's funny that. Yeah, there's there's so many. I'm, I'm the excited. Three, the 360. Yeah. Being able to move around the tree and shoot 360 is a monstrous deal if you're in big yeah. trees. And keeping the tree as a buffer. 
you know, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos where they don't do that because they're running off just the platform and with no steps on the backside. Yep. But, you know, the ideal scenario is to be able to move around the tree on steps. So keeping that tree between you so you don't get picked is a monstrous deal. Yeah. And, and I, to kind of go with what you just said, I'm hunting a private piece right now that a guy lets me hunt. And there's two other guys that hunt it. And... One guy has really been in my ear for the last seven years, and he's hunting out of a saddle now. He's totally using scent locks. Or he hasn't paid attention to wind in three years. He was a deer deflector when I first started there. He's a threat now. Yeah. He's a, he is a threat to... There hasn't been a shooter buck on that property in three years, but when there is one, he will be a threat to kill that deer to me. And he never was before. I yeah. never viewed him as a threat hunting out of a tree stand. Huh. Yeah, I, I'm excited this year. I'm getting my dad in the saddle, and he's never and he's awesome. N- not that he's ever against it. He just never knew about him really, or never. And I've been. He's like, I really like to try one, so I got him one to teach him how to use it. And I'm I'm afraid because he's deadly as it is. So it's gonna be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it is like that. Yeah, he's a badass hunter. That's yeah, cool. it'll be it'll be really cool. And he, he hunts a lot off the ground too. And um, so it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how. How he does that. I mean, now he's going to be able to hunt your trees, dude. Oh, I, I, well, it's funny. We don't even, I joke about my whole family's like diehard bow hunters and, and just hunters in general. And, and, but none of us hunt the same areas. We're so competitive. Oh, wow. that know, we just are like that too. We just, we have our own spots and, you know, and if, if he needed a, tr- you know, a spot to go to, yeah. he could go to mine. I wouldn't <laughs> care. And vice versa. Well, actually he threw me out of his areas because I, what, when I was younger, I went and I screwed it up you and I was missing up. bucks and doing all this stuff. And I'd have all these opportunities. He's like, you burned out my spot. <laughs> He's like, you, you need to, you're, um, you go, go. There. you go on your own. I'm like, all right. So, uh, you know funny. what? My kids and me did that too. I, na- the only time I've ever <laughs> hunted with my kids is when they started out, yeah. I taught them. And then when we go to Kansas, other than that, they have their own spots and they, they kind of pissed me off because when they were in school, obviously they could hunt on their buddies and girlfriends properties and yeah. stuff. And I was always like, Hey, can you get me in there? And they're not. I let I ain't getting you in there. I'm hunting there. Yeah. <laughs> Find your own spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's oh, that's God. really funny. And it was always fun too. I mean, yeah, because they were serious like I was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. It's different. Like when we go to Southern Ohio together, we hunt similar spots, and because we're going to kind of on our own. But even then, too, we're kind of same I, same thing. Tell you guys have a little friendly competition. Oh, oh, yeah. It 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 definitely is. <laughs> You know, he'd, he'd do anything for me or if I was, you know, for some reason, I say I moved out of state and I came back and I needed a place to go that he had scouted. He would, without a doubt, give me that spot. But if we're we're on level playing fields, not a chance. <laughs> it's it's competitive. I will guarantee you this 100 percent. Your dad is very proud of you because my I my son, John, is just a badass hunter. Yeah. And Chris was, too. And um I, I sort of, when they kill a big buck, I kind of live through that yeah. as well because I feel like that's a reflection on myself. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure your dad does with you. Yeah. I'm positive of when that. My dad was actually with me this past year. It was during rifle season, actually, and uh, we were together, me and him and, and my one buddy, and I killed my biggest buck, the 155-inch buck. I was telling you, the eight wow. and a half years old. And, yes. and, um, wow. and he came up on it, and you— it it was, he was like happier than oh you. yeah you could see like you know he was trying not to like have tears come out of his <laughs> eyes you know he was he was so excited about it and that uh you know he was awesome. happier than if he he would have killed it and that was that was pretty cool so that is way yeah, cool it is it is that is aw- that, i love those stories it man. is and uh, there's nothing like a father son bond or yeah. father daughter he I mean, he and he won't like he's not gonna you know, tell me that essentially. But my, my, I remember my mom was like, she's like, oh, your dad just was like ecstatic <laughs> for like a week after that, you know? And, and, um, well, you saw it in his face at the yeah. moment. Oh yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. So yeah, that, that is way cool. But anyways, John, where, where can people find, um, I know you've been putting a lot of videos out on YouTube. Yeah. What, what's your YouTube channel name? Eberhard Outdoors. Eberhard Outdoors. Yep, we just posted, uh, I've got an ESS signature saddle sold through Tethered. Yep. And um, I put a bunch of videos on there as far as how to properly use it. Because I do stuff a lot different than a lot of these other guys do. Yeah. You know, I don't use platforms. I use steps. I move around the tree much more than they do. 
I never turn my body around on the platform on the same side of the tree as the deer because that's easy to get picked. Uh, but they're hunting in different areas where they can get away with some of that stuff. Yeah. So um, I put a bunch of videos out on Eberhard Outdoors. In fact, we dumped four of them all at one time okay. uh, last week. And uh, so we got Eberhard Outdoors. And also on my website, which is, uh, if you Google my name, my website would pop up. But it's deer-john.net deer-john.net okay and on my website i've got all my podcasts are on there um i do workshops in the spring that information's on there and then up at the top there's a bunch of tabs and there's a ess which is my eberhart signature saddle um, instructions and so if you hover over that ess tab it'll bring a down a drop down of nine sub menus of you know the parts of a ess how to put it on how to maneuver around trees tips using a girth hitch yeah. there's just a lot of different things on there that you can go through whether you're using an ess or any saddle for that matter awesome yeah th- thanks th- yeah that's pretty it's got to be pretty awesome to see your signature saddle here with the you know biggest yeah. saddle company and like it's i got something else really surprising for 2022 another Ooh. signature item from a different company really oh yeah it's gonna be awesome Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. And then you you uh, you're active on Instagram as well, right? No, you're not. I don't do Instagram? Oh, I thought I thought no. you were for some reason. Facebook. Kid, my son Joe might be, but I'm uh, not. Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Facebook. Okay, I mean, yeah. that's right. I yep. I got a Facebook on. site. Eberhard Saddle Hunting Pressured Whitetails or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'll put links in the the show notes here. So, John, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Bo. I pleasure talking to you. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.